never had that before. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Digital Leaders on New Frontiers, a TV News Check Working Lunch webinar. We're very pleased to have Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, moderating today's event. Michael, please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to what promises to be a wide ranging discussion with our assembled digital leaders talking about New Frontiers. My name is Michael Depp. I'm the editor of TV News Check, and I'm very pleased to be with six excellent panelists today. Let me introduce them to you. They are Catherine Bedalamente, the VP and Chief Innovation Officer of Graham Media Group. Welcome, Catherine. Thank Lisa you. Bishop, the Chief Digital Officer of Allen Media Broadcasting. Hi, Lisa. Afternoon. Jennifer Mitchell is SVP of Content Development at ABC Owned Television Stations. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Adam Ostro is Chief Digital Officer at Tegna. Welcome, Adam. Hi, thanks for having me. Ethan Drellinger is the Global Client Solutions Engineer from The Weather Company. Hi, Ethan. Hi, good afternoon. And finally, Derek Gebler is Vice President of Broadcast and Video at Town News. Hello, Derek. Hey, Michael. So welcome to everyone. Um, before we start, our discussion is going to fall into a few main buckets, um, expanding digital media to attract younger audiences and fine-tuned programming, forging closer bonds with consumers, and expanding existing revenue streams. Along the way, we'll talk about streaming, mobile, and desktop, all the principal three digital platforms that are at stake right now, though I think podcasting and possibly some others may sneak in here as well. To our audience, we welcome your questions as the webinar progresses, and I'll try to get to as many as I can, but don't wait until the end to submit them. Please also use the Q&A button on your screen, not the chat, to send them over our way. So let's start. And I want to start on the digital content front. For all of our broadcasters here first, how important is versioning your content? That is differentiating for streaming versus desktop and mobile, not to mention the different social platforms. Is, is there an audience expectation that there should be a different iteration for each device and each platform? Or have we reached some sort of point of digital agnosticism and one piece of digital video content can go to all channels at once? And I'd like to go around the group to get your take on that. Start with Jennifer. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think I think the audience has dictated, you know, that there there are reasons that people go to certain platforms for certain types of content. So from a formatting perspective, um, from a content type perspective, from a length perspective there are differentiations that we're still continuing to make. You know, when you think about the streaming experience, we'll start with that, right? It's, it's definitely more of a lean back television-like experience. And so um, we're doing a lot in the long form space there. Um, but then when you think about, you know, some of these social platforms like Snapchat comes to mind, you know, obviously shorter content, short form video works there. Mobile apps, right? Mobile, uh, you know, in terms of short form content there. Um, and then you get into the live space too, right? What, where are people consuming live experiences versus VOD? So I, I, I do think that there is still versioning happening um, with the variety of different platforms that are out there you know, on our owned platforms and all of the third party platforms where we uh, distribute our content. Catherine, is that true at Graham? Oh, for, for, for sure. You know, we're, we're looking at what works well across all platforms because there are there is some content that can work across all platforms but we're also recognizing that we have to tell stories differently based on who the audience is and how we're actually um, distributing that content so 
a lot of what we're focused on right now is trying to figure out the things that work well, um, first and foremost, across all platforms, but also let's lean into the things that we need to be doing in terms of our storytelling and making them work um, with the audience in mind and on the platforms in which we're serving them. Adam, are you versioning at Tegna? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, certainly the content we're putting on social, uh, much of it is different in nature than what we put on TV. Uh, I would say in terms of how we're thinking about our OTT experiences, you know, one of the main reasons people are coming to our stations on OTT, our apps on Roku, Fire TV, et cetera, um, they are coming for time shifted news, right? So, uh, so they're not consuming our full length newscast generally. We actually don't put them on social platforms, um, but they are coming to our OTT apps for that, as well as you know, the on-demand experience and finding the things they wanna catch up on specifically. You know what we are starting to lean into more heavily on OTT, um, as, as one of the panels mentioned before, is more long form uh, streaming content, right? So whether that's extended versions of something that was on TV, content that's made specifically for digital, um, or through uh, our recent investment in local sports through the acquisition of Locked On, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, you know, we are starting to experiment um, more with that on, uh, on OTT because we are seeing, you know, the average watch times on, uh, on our OTT platforms are many multiples more than what we see on, uh, on our mobile and desktop products. Right, right. And Lisa, how about it, Alan? Yeah, similar to, you know, what my counterparts are doing, we, we are finding that the long form video is performing very well in OTT. Um, but we also found that during the onset of, of COVID that our OTT numbers skyrocketed. Um, and we weren't doing anything different in terms of versioning specific content for OTT. I mean, at that point, we were just trying to produce the content as quickly as possible and distribute it as many places as possible. Um, you know, we've had some time to be able to reel that in a little bit and look at where our, our, our consumers going and where are we able to follow the metrics and the numbers to decide what, what plays well on different platforms. Um, we don't do a whole lot of content driven things on social. We're using that more for a marketing tool to market to our, our consumers of where to find us, when to find us, what's coming. Um, but we don't give the whole, um, the whole story or all video on, on social. So that's probably the biggest differentiator for us is, is how we're using social. Okay, okay. Uh, Ethan and Derek, you wanna weigh in on maybe some, what your clients are doing on this front, starting with Derek? Sure, yeah, with, with our multiple CMSs that we run, those are feeding a lot of different destinations. Whenever possible, we're trying to use automatic processes so that we're not versioning out. You know, we, we can automatically have a different version of something. But um, when it comes to OTT, I think that's where we're seeing the biggest uh, different type of content being offered. We'll have, you know, the ability for our customers, they'll have multiple live channels, not just the single uh, replay of what's going on over the air, but they'll actually have additional, you know, OTT exclusive channels. Um, they'll have channels that uh, our replays, but maybe it will be some exclusive content of like um, some sort of sporting event or, or something that maybe wasn't promoted on the web in a certain way. So it's, but that's an entire broadcast of uh, different sporting events. So it, those are probably the biggest areas other than what everybody has said about social, OTT is probably the biggest different platform and is treated differently. Okay, Ethan? So as far as versioning goes, it really falls into line with a lot of what we do in terms of getting the right piece of content in front of the right person at the right time, agnostic of the platform that they're on. Um, I was reading right before um, I jumped on here, uh, something from eMarketer. People are spending more than 13 hours a day immersed in media, whether that's mobile, online, television, OTT, et cetera. 13 hours is a lot of time to be immersed in content. Um, and what you really want to do is make sure the content meets the platform. So it meets the needs of the person at that time. And we've got some tools that are doing that. And we talk to, you know, some of our customers are on this panel where we talk to them about exactly this concept and being able to present that content in a way that makes sense to people and is meaningful to people and really start to grow the audience and grow the engagement of the audience across the platforms. So it's not, versioning is important, 
but understanding the different platforms and the way people use those platforms is just as important. 13 hours is a lot of time to be immersed in anything, let alone content. Um, Jennifer, ABC uh, seems to be making some very aggressive efforts to reach younger audiences via its digital platforms, notably um, with the Localish project, which began as a digital endeavor, has grown a lot since then. Can you talk a little bit, for those who may not know it, uh, to Localish's aims and its growth trajectory? Yeah, yeah. And Michael, you know, you and I have spent some time together over the last few years talking about the, the origins of Localish. But for those who might not be familiar with it, <clears throat> we launched essentially a ninth brand about over a little over three years ago um, called Localish. And the intent was, you know, one of our goals was, you know, how are we going to attract the next generation of audience? What is the next generation of storytelling that, that consumers in that demo are looking for? Um, and, and one of the things, and we did a lot of research leading up to the launch of this brand, was that we needed to be do, doing more positive storytelling, right? When people think of local news, um, sometimes there's, there's negative sentiments, right? There's a lot of crime, there's a lot of murder, a lot of mayhem. And we really wanted to get into telling the positive stories about the good people and our great communities. And thus Localish was born. And Michael, as you mentioned, it started as a digital native brand um, with, with the intent of it being very widely distributed, being everywhere the consumer was. Um, you know, here we are three plus years later and the brand has seen so much success and growth. Um, typically you see something start on linear and then move to digital this was the exact opposite. So it started as a digital native brand with a dot-com site, um, and of course being present on all the major social platforms. Since then, um, we have done a variety of different things. Um, the first biggest shift in the brand was um, converting our D2 channel into a 24 seven network, and that's called the Localish Network. So that's been, we launched that actually just at the, a month before COVID hit, which is always interesting timing to, to launch a new product. Um, and then really excited to share that just last month, um, and this is our first real streaming national distribution play, uh, we launched on Hulu Live to their 4 million plus subs. So that's pretty exciting. And you know, we create, it, it's very much a lifestyle media brand. And so we create content, um, both short form, and obviously now that we're in the linear and streaming business, now long form in many different genres. So think, you know, food, community, small businesses, travel, et cetera, beauty, fitness. Um, and you know, again, audience, audience reaction has been really positive. We just recently launched, um, we're going into season two um, on Snapchat, again, reaching a different audience there. And I've seen a ton of success, both from an audience consumption perspective, but also from a revenue perspective on that platform. Um, our stations are all contributors. Um, we have station con contributions, we have station shows, and then we also have a division team that works on and across the brand for all the various platforms. So the really exciting, um, really exciting initiative, and um, it's been a really big success for us. Do those station shows feed into the D two uh, stream as yes. part of it? Okay. Yes. And yes. so, what what are, what are you what are the KPIs for Localish? What are you looking at there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's you know engagement of the content, right? Wherever the content is distributed. Um, obviously, there is also revenue KPIs, which I won't go into detail, but um, one thing about Localish that's really great for our organization is that because of the positive nature of the content, it's very, very brand friendly, brand safe from an advertiser perspective. So we do a lot of custom content storytelling um, for brands that want to be associated with that type of content, which is great because when you, again, look at the landscape hard news, it's not always something that an advertiser, particularly in the digital space, wants to be associated with. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting revenue opportunity from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Adam, you you have a similar endeavor, not so much in terms of content, but but the nature of it with Verify at Tegna, um, which has mushroomed from a national uh, into a national enterprise with its own national team, and their iterations at Tegna stations. Again, for those who may not know it, briefly, can you lay out uh, Verify's own? 
trajectory from digital to air now? Yeah, so Verify exists really to combat misinformation, which has become obviously an enormous problem, both on the internet and in society. Uh, over the last several years, it actually started back in, uh, all the way back in 2015. Uh, it was something that a group of uh, innovative Tegna employees came with, came up with at one of our uh, internal summits. Um, but Verify so started as, you know, effectively a format for uh, our TV stations. So, you know, 90 second packages um, taking on a piece of misinformation that you know, we either saw going viral on social media or the audience had asked us directly. Um, you know, we tested that quite a bit uh, with audiences, did perform better than any pilots we'd ever seen. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, um, you know, today, most of our stations um, run verified packages, either that are produ produced by our national team or produced locally, um, looking at local issues. Um, but starting last year, we made an investment in really turning Verify into a national multi-platform brand. So uh, one of our first moves is we launched uh, on Snapchat Discover, similar to, uh, to Localish, um, where we uh, have quickly grown. We have more than 170,000 subscribers to our Snapchat channel. Um, and of them, you know, 50% are under the age of 24, which is reaching for us a completely different demographic than we generally reach on television and even on most of our digital platforms. So that gave us uh, a lot of confidence to scale it even further. So over the last several months, we've uh, we've brought in a, a national team of about 20 folks um, that is now publishing multiple video packages a day, both for, uh, for broadcast as well as uh, on digital platforms. Verify now has its own website, which you can find at verifythis.com. Uh, as well as social handles across all the major platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you can find us uh, at Verify This um, as well. So uh, it's really evolving into a multi-platform brand for us that lives on our television stations, uh, as well as our station websites and at its own uh, now destination as well. And you mentioned a few minutes ago that Tegna also acquired the Locked On Sports uh, Podcast Network earlier this year, and you've been integrating that into some local stations as well. So what, what's happening there? Yeah, so Locked On is the leading local podcast, local leading podcast network for local sports. Um, so what Locked On does, it started about four years ago. They create daily uh, five days a week podcasts for every professional team across the four major sports. Uh, as well as dozens of universities. Um, so what we've started to do since we acquired that company in January uh, is a few things. One, uh, we're now using those Locked On hosts. So the host of uh, Locked On Pelicans in New Orleans, for instance, when they uh, fired their coach last week, uh, they had the host of Locked On Pelicans on WWL in New Orleans to talk about that. Um, we're also starting to turn the Locked On podcasts into uh, video shows as well. Um, so you can now find about 20 of the Locked On podcasts as video um, on YouTube uh, under their own channels. So if you go to YouTube and look for Locked On Mavericks or Locked On Broncos, uh, you can find a channel with all of the episodes as video. And where we have uh, stations, those videos also live on our OTT apps. So in Dallas, for instance, you can get the Mavericks and Cowboys podcasts as video shows on the WFAA OTT app as well as on their website. So those are some of the ways we're, we're starting to work with them. Um, we're seeing some really great traction on video um, and we'll continue to scale that through the course of this year. Catherine, Graham has used streaming for quite a while as kind of a testing ground for experimenting with new local programming and connecting with new audiences there. Um, I know you have a latest of many examples called Solutionaries. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and generally how you're using and how you have used OTT as an experimental space for programming? We do think that OTT is the perfect place for us to experiment with new programming. And we've had some of our markets go in, you know, all with both feet. Uh, KSAT in San Antonio has done a ton of original programming for their OTT channels and We've learned a lot because of the fact that they've been so aggressive in that space and applied it to the rest of the markets. Uh, Solutionaries actually was a show that was born from looking at just our traditional broadcast news. 
and saying, let's try to figure out a way of turning this on its head. Let's try to experiment in a way that we've never before. And we can use our OTT and streaming channels to really measure whether or not this is successful. So last week was our pilot episode that we launched in Orlando. Orlando was our partner station for this, this experiment, frankly, and, and we're going to expand it to the rest of the group. But we worked with a team in, in Orlando and had a group of people from Graham Digital working along with them to create sort of what we're hoping is like the next iteration of local news. And it really is based on the idea of not necessarily just reporting on the problems, but trying to get to the solutions to the problems. And so a huge emphasis on solutions journalism and making sure that we're not just highlighting the things that are bad in our communities, but how we can actually make our communities better. We like to say it's not like reporting, you know, when we first started on this, it's let's not just do a good news show, let's do news that's good for you, as opposed to let's just focus on all the happy stuff. Let's try to actually come up with real solutions for our communities. And so, you know, the first episode was on, um, of course, a really difficult topic, police reform. And what we did was really dive deep into that, that um, you know, um, subject matter and said, we really need to talk about what's happening from all angles and frankly, tell the story in a way we would have never probably felt as comfortable telling on our broadcast station. And so um, it was... It ended up being a lot longer than we thought, but you know the thing is, we didn't put any sort of limitations on how long it was going to be. How and our, um, it was over an hour in, in total content. But the idea is that we really built it so that each individual element, each individual story, was built to be able to live on its own, and we break it all apart. And then some pieces actually are built to actually live, you know, first and foremost on YouTube. So those individual stories, um, their strength is first and foremost on YouTube. And we see that as being a way of being able to have the totality of the story, but also break it apart to be able to see how it can live without the total show. Our second episode, we're gonna really try to streamline that, you know, cause part of this isn't just learning how to do news differently. It's also process innovation. So how can we actually create a show that's not going to probably take as many resources, but actually reach those same goals. And so, the next episode should be a completely different version of what we did for the, the first episode, but allow us to still see, are we actually helping our communities to come up with solutions to some of the most biggest plaguing problems that are plaguing them? So it sounds like from, from a length standpoint, um, Adam, uh, Jennifer, Catherine, you're still kind of taking advantage of that expand and contractability that, that digital allows you. To, to make something as short as it needs to be or as long without those, those linear constraints imposed upon you. Yeah, it actually creates, I think, such a better experience for the end user if we're not trying to hit a you know, minute 30 package that we're actually doing exactly what we should do, which is tell the full story. Right, right. Jennifer, um, each of your eight stations currently have streaming apps and you're producing a lot of bespoke content, OTT content, including these longer form documentaries. You have an uh, Our America series um, from your race and culture team, who I interviewed some time ago, really interesting conversation on our podcast. Can you talk a little bit about the content strategy that ABC has there? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, again, um, during the pandemic, right at the start of the pandemic, released 32 OTT apps, right, across the major services. Um, and, you know, again, COVID hit and there was a lot of content production, as Lisa sort of alluded to earlier, that um, all of our stations were, were leaning into in terms of long form content. And what better platform, right, what better place to house all of this because we all have limited linear inventory, right? And so there's been a ton of experimentation. Um, you know, Michael, you mentioned our race and culture team. You know, we made a commitment um, back in, you know, last summer and we brought on a race and culture team, um, three executive producers and then eight multi-skilled journalists that are embedded in each of our markets at our stations um, who are essentially covering the race and culture beat and I will say that it's not just 11 people, the entire organization is contributing to this, but these are the people sort of leading the charge throughout. And as a result of bringing that team on, we um, launched a, a new brand called Our America um, to really tackle 
um, what was happening in our country in the moment, right? All of the racial reckoning. Um, one of our goals is obviously in inclusive storytelling, diverse storytelling, um, not only within the stories that we tell, but the people who are featured within, the experts and the sources, right, uh, from a day-to-day -day news coverage. And this team is really truly leading that effort. Um, since the team came on board, which started in October of last year, we've produced um, six documentaries under the Our America brand, um, kicking off with one uh, in October, uh, Our America Living While Black. Um, we did uh, Our America Women Forward. We did a Climate of Hope one in and around um, Earth Day. Um, we've done uh, Black Freedom for Juneteenth, Who I'm Meant to Be for Pride Month. There has been an amazing amount of content that's been produced. And to Catherine's point, it's really freeing to not have to just think about, okay, I can only do a 22 minute show because I only have a half hour time slot or um, I can only do a minute and 30 package. And so we do version, <clears throat> we've done linear versions, right? But then we've also done sort of what we're calling director's cuts for our OTT platforms. And we've seen a, a tremendous amount of consumption um, in and around the long form content. Um, and then in addition to that, outside of the Our America series, all of our stations are really leaning into long form premium documentary storytelling in a variety of different genres. And when you think about, you know, for the broadcasters, the, the, the rich archives of content that we have in our libraries, um, one, one genre is, is true crime. Um, and looking back historically at events um, that have happened in, our, in the history of our communities and really tapping into that and leveraging that. And then of course, um, you know, things like the environment and, um, you know, we have three California stations. So wildfires, um, the impacts of the pandemic in terms of what's happening around the country, our, our California stations banded together to, to produce a documentary called California Dreaming. You know, is the California dream still alive as people um, made some decisions during the pandemic to leave the state? So there's a lot of that content, Michael, being produced and we have a, a pretty large slate of upcomings um, that we're working on or that are actively in production. And of course, you know, being part of the Walt Disney Company and having Hulu as a platform, um, we're distributing a lot of our content there as well. So reaching new audiences, younger audiences, different audiences on that platform too. You know, you take all this together and it's kind of, it wouldn't be, I think, out of place to say, we might be entering a new golden age of, of local news content with all this this uh, material that's being produced, what digital is allowing us to do. I plenty more to ask you, but a quick audience question. Anyone can jump in and take this quickly. Um, how are you measuring content success across the platforms? Do you have tools that combine each funnel? Anyone wanna take that? I mean, I can speak, we're doing it pretty much manually. So we have reporting tools, but then we have to kind of go into each one and then aggregate it together into our own kind of spreadsheet dashboard. So um, not super simple and somewhat time consuming, but we're able to get that look. I think what we're missing um, at this point is, you know, are we double counting audience you know, across these platforms. I think that that's why, I think to your point, Jennifer, engagement is so important um, because that is the amount of time that they're engaging with your content and your brand. Um, for us anyways, it's been difficult to be able to, to aggregate between, is this the same user that's coming to all these platforms or are these, you know, unique per platform? Yeah, the one, um, you know, the one that has certainly become our North Star as we move into more into streaming and OTT has been kind of time spent and overall consumption, um, you know, or the, uh, the amount of the aggregate amount of minutes consumers are spending with our content moving in the right direction. Um, and we get kind of different looks into that based on platform. But, you know, right now we're, we're really focused on how that number is growing on, uh, on OTT. And we're the same. I mean, minutes watched is a is a metric that we're constantly watching. So I agree with Adam and Lisa. And we pull from a variety of different sources um, in terms of um, where we're collecting the data from. We have a, a content strategy and analytics team that powers all of the data. Um, and, and, and to Lisa's point, unfortunately, some of it is manual. Um, and so we're, we're constantly looking for ways to improve that process. But you know, data informs all of our decisions along with our gut instincts, but data is a big piece of decision-making on a day-to-day -day basis. 
let me shift to a new uh, topic here. Um, digital is an enormous tool to forge closer bonds with consumers. Catherine, Graham has been developing a membership program in that vein for over a year now. Can you tell us what's underpinning that program, your goals, and how widely it's rolled out across the group? I think that this is a really hard thing to answer because I think that membership applies to so much. I could talk about this endlessly. I could talk for hours about why I think membership is so important to what we do. Um, first and foremost, we don't know a lot about our audience and, you know, we need to have a better idea. We, we don't compete against the digital superpowers or against even the local newspapers when it comes to the uh, audience information that we have um, about our individual users, which is a really bad place to be. And Google announced today that they're delaying the cookie cop cookie apocalypse. I can never say it the first time. Uh, cookie apocalypse because of the fact that they're now going to not have you know, turn off the third party cookies on Chrome until 2023, which is something that really was a huge part of fueling us to look at membership because of the fact that if we are moving into this space where our programmatic revenue is going to be, you know, impacted by the removal of third party cookies, we need to actually control our own destiny to a certain extent. And so it's really about starting to create um, a large, you know, database of first party data. And so um, we feel like if we know more about the audience and we have this data on the audience, we can just serve them better from a content standpoint, from an advertising standpoint, that we can have this deeper, better relationship and our journalism is gonna benefit from that. So a lot of it has to do with that. The other part too is the fact that um, every time that we are interacting with our audience, we get something back. And Social has been primarily the space where we're doing all of that interaction. Again, I wanna take back the power that we've given over to social and bring it onto our own sites and have those interactions and relationships happen on a platform that I control, not one where there can be an algorithm change and suddenly my traffic isn't you know, impacted in a big, big way. So um, bringing back that control to our owned and operated platforms is, is definitely another major part of that. And then, of course, just all of the different ways we can eventually monetize this relationship. So being able to give them exclusive offers, being able to have exclusive events or maybe a, a, a better experience or a first, you know, first class experience at an event, um, being able to give them even something as simple as a survey that only goes out to our insiders or to our members. Um, those little things have really proven to be super valuable to those members, and they just love being able to have this two-way conversation with our stations. And so as we learn more and more about the value of what membership gives our consumers and our audience, it's sometimes the littlest things that have, you know, really proven out to be the things that members value the most. And so it's, it's been incredibly rewarding. And we're seeing, you know, obviously, as we drive our audience into this funnel, membership is at the bottom of it, you know, and knowing more about the audience means that we have a better chance of being able to delight them. Ethan, you want to you wanna add a little bit about the first party data there? Sure. As Catherine pointed out, so that first party data is really important. And with Google delaying the, the um, end of cookies is a nice sort of crutch for everybody. But you really have to start thinking in terms of how to what first party data you have and how to use that first party data. And one of the things that we do on at Weather Company really is around location and building on top of location because that's something that doesn't go away in IDFA, doesn't go away when the cookie goes away and it becomes a great building block. So latitude, longitude, you know, we can obviously we overlay the weather to that, but then we can take some of that data that Catherine's gathering from her membership program and overlay that. So you can then start really start to map out where your customers are, where your viewers are, where people who are interacting with your content are, what they're doing at that point in time. Are they in a Starbucks? Are they at a ball field? Are they in a parking lot at a tailgate party? All of those types of things. And then you can start to serve specific content to them and target ads to them based on those little breadcrumbs that they're giving up to you voluntarily at this point in time. So it's a great way to start to begin that strategy discussion of, hey, we're going to lose these identifiers. We've already lost the IDFA with Apple. So now how do we build upon that now? And what can we continue to use? And there's some great building blocks here in you know, what, what Graham is doing with um, the membership program. A lot of what we do is all geo-based and geolocation-based. And it's a great place to start that process at. And Catherine, how many stations have the membership program now? 
So we have four of our markets launched and we're just getting ready to launch Roanoke uh, and Orlando. And then, okay. sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. I was just going to say some of the markets have taken, you know, a different approach to it. So some have focused more on the news value and others have really looked at more of the lifestyle. So Houston really is focused a lot on their Houston Life program and creating a lot of value around that. And we love it because it means that we can look at, you know, different um, experiments in the markets to see, again, our audience comes to us from a, for a number of different reasons. And sometimes it's hard news and other times it's some of the softer things that we do too. It's a very organic process by each station and that's interesting. Um, Derek, uh, Town News has a membership model of its own. Can you explain what the aims are there, how it works? Sure, yeah, at Town News, We've been working on a membership model. We have several different types of programs. Our, our main program is called Audience Plus. And in Audience Plus, it's about building that funnel, right? It's about collecting first party data whenever possible and building on that, making sure that there's awareness at the digital level. Then there's building upon it as far as other programs that you can plug into it, like newsletters and things like that. And then uh, for some customers, you know, how do you add a paid membership uh, aspect to that? Most broadcasters at this point are not at the paid side of things, and that's okay. But it does apply to things on, on the OTT side that at some point in the future, what we're doing is we're laying the building blocks so that you could have a paid per view event. There's a one-time special event, and it's separate from the rest of your video content, but that you could actually expose that and have a paid event if you wanted to. Right now, you know, we're we're approaching it from multiple aspects though. You have you have your digital properties, you have the websites themselves, but then we're trying to build more hooks into our OTT side of things. Where our OTT side of things, it's not a pure membership model. What it really is is, is a registration model where you can actually have uh, optional registered users log in and have a Netflix like experience. So you're capturing some of that first party data. And then uh, our goal is to actually build upon that so that there are more hooks so that you can actually start to show different types of content. We do have a content recommendation already built into some of that, but it's, it's all about building on what uh, several of, of you have already talked about, which is more ways to incentivize um, our users, customers to use first party data uh, as much of that as we possibly can and putting it into the right funnels and, and exposing it so that it can be used for other things. We're collecting tons of data, but it's all in silos. And really what we're trying to do is trying to pull that together in a way that can be more useful. Lisa, I wanna get you to weigh in on this. You've been in the digital side for a minute in this industry. So um, can, you, can you weigh in on, on how, much progress the industry's made in actually capturing that first party data and using it productively for content customization or monetization opportunities? I mean, it's been a long minute. Um, <laughs> I think rather slowly, at least in our case. I mean, I remember back when we had, you know, a link for member center, you know, on our website some many iteration ago. And given that we are broadcasters and we give our content for free, free over the air, that's you know the, the basis of our existence. We kind of went back and forth with, well, what do we you know entice them with for membership? Um, why would they want to be a member? And I think that that's where um, you know some of the things that Catherine mentioned that they're doing, you know, kind of cracking that code, giving them something back, some sort of exclusivity, you know, for. for for us right now, we're doing, um, you know, newsletters is, is probably one of the key areas, newsletters and contests, um, where we're able to collect some first party data. Um, we've started to do more niche content um, newsletters, which is another separate opportunity because it's a very, you know, niche interest. Um, I think that we could be doing more, um, especially on the conversation piece, commenting, um, you know, having folks provide their real first name and last name when they when they want to comment um you know we've we've thrown some of that over the fence to you know plugging in facebook widgets and things like that but i do think that there is more opportunity that we're not seizing that we need to make sure that now we have until 2023 to 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 get that ironed out and um see what else we can do to make those connections um you know the, the subscription model has been tossed around 
you know, here or there, but it's just, it's a very difficult, I think, just from, in terms of, we've been doing it this way for so long, how do we move into a paid model when we are really trying to serve the community with, with their content needs? And we offer things in terms of our local news content that, you know, these other behemoths aren't able to do. So we have to keep that, keep that tight and make sure we, we stick to our roots of delivering that, um, but in a way that we can all win. Let me move the conversation back to streaming, um, which has obviously burst onto the scene as a seismic force. I'm curious that for the four broadcasters here, what's the reporting structure that you have for streaming? Who, who does the, the head of streaming report to? Is that all housed under digital? Let's start with Jennifer. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, when we think about digital, at least within our group, um, we think about it as it's everybody's responsibility. It's no longer a department's responsibility, right? And that really translates into streaming as well, right? We are in the business of creating good content. And linear obviously is a major, um, our, our major and most lucrative distribution point, but streaming is is our future in some ways. And so from a reporting structure perspective, yes, I mean, my background is comes from digital um, and now I'm overseeing content development, but also with a, with a large focus on the streaming platforms and the digital platforms. So there's a division team, at least where, where we are that, that report into me and we have a lot of oversight over that, but our stations all have digital teams, right? And, and content contributors who produce content for streaming platforms. So I guess, I, I guess the answer is there's not really, um, we're trying to break down those silos, right? Between digital and linear. And we're really coming together as one group in terms of content creation, Michael. And, and, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll continue down that path as well. Okay, what about it at Alan, Lisa? Yeah, so Alan Media Broadcasting, we don't, we don't have a streaming department, um, so to speak, I guess. I guess that would be me if, if there was a head of streaming. Um, but I am seeing for the first time, you know, as, as Jennifer alluded to that it's OTT, I think is the first, you know, coming together of broadcast and digital in a sense where everyone's kind of trying to figure this thing out. Um, you know, the OTT, the streaming content is only as good as the content that the stations are producing. Um, we're not in the same boat um, as some of these other guys, but we're not out creating long form only digital content for OTT platforms. Um, I'd love for us to get there. And I think that there's absolutely opportunity there. Um, so right now it's, it's the, the ad age of we're streaming our content over the air and we are streaming that content in our OTT mobile, you know, all of our other distribution platforms. Gotcha. Adam, what's the reporting structure there at Tegna? Yeah, ultimately, uh, I guess I own the uh, OTT products uh, at Tegna. So from a, a you know, strategy and, and product development standpoint, um, but, it, but it really is a full core press for the, the whole organization right now, right? So, um, you know, it, it, it really requires us changing, uh, changing the way we think about content to some degree on the local level. Um, and that's, you know, certainly our our, you know, quote unquote, quote, news folks working with the digital folks on the ground uh, locally at the stations from a programming perspective. A lot of the new investments we're making and things like Verify and Locked On, you know, those were really done through an OTT lens in terms of, you know, they, they're one thing today, but as we look two to three years out, what can they become in terms of, you know, being a major part of the uh, consumer experience on OTT? Um, and then, of course, Tegna also owns Premion, which is our uh, OTT uh, streaming advertising business, which has been growing um, incredibly quickly as well. And Catherine, does a buck stop with you? Yes, pretty much. You know, I was going to say, though, with lots of collaboration with the markets, lots of collaboration with the leaders and uh, working with our director of technology and everyone that we have to on the broadcast side. So it's, it's, really, it's really us working together as a team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and revenue, just really briefly for the four broadcasters, does revenue all fall into the uh, um, OTT, fall into the digital bucket, or does it spill into other buckets? We have it all in our digital, addressable. Okay. okay. Digital as well. Um, 
Ethan and, and Derek, I want to give you a chance to weigh in uh, if you'd like on, on OTT as well, uh, starting with, uh, with Derek, what, what your work is there in these days. Yeah, with OTT, we started, I mean, we, we, we started, oh gosh, I, it, it was at least five years ago with our OTT products and they were, were grown out of what was originally the Calkins Media OTT projects. And uh, so what we've been doing over these years is building in a lot of customization. There's, there's a lot of configuration that can be dynamic, can be on the fly. Um, we've been adding a lot more customization where it comes to custom weather on OTT, podcasts. There's been a lot of things that our customers have been bringing to us in the last couple of years where they're finding new ways to apply to OTT that, that we never re originally envisioned. So that on top of you know, making sure that we tie all of our platforms together so that if you're watching a video on OTT and then you go and watch the same video on the desktop or mobile, we're now making sure that part of the registration process we have in place that 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 follows the user across multiple platforms on our side. So tying that all together, making better use of a singular user um, I think I think Lisa might have mentioned it. It's like making sure we know where that user is going across all the different platforms is, is, is where we're putting a lot of our efforts into right now. Ethan, did you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, yeah, and I think Adam and Derek have kind of touched on this a little bit. Weather is a significant can be a significant part of an OTT strategy um, because weather drives decisions in a lot of different ways. And we sort of have some weather stuff that we're doing in the OTT space a little bit on the longer form side. Um, and really forward looking kind of weather. So not, you know, the two and a half minute forecast, you'll get it, you know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, but rather kind of forward looking, looking into more lifestyle type content and stuff that we can start to push out into addressable areas. Um, and then we're leaning into our ability to target people because all these OTT apps are targetable or addressable. So we're able to then start to deliver that messaging to the right person at the right time. And we can tap tag um, ads into that as well in a dynamic way. So those ads make sense and resonate and increase the value, right? Because ultimately, right, the value of the ad is around the click, through, right? And so if you can get your click through rates up to a better level, you'll start to then see some significant monetization opportunities come out of it. And ultimately, right, that's where we need to get to as an industry is, hey, we've got great content. People are watching 13 plus hours of content a day, right? So how do you monetize that content? And how do you sort of begin to impact the bottom line on the digital side, the same way that broadcast does, right? So get rid of that old, you know, digital dimes for broadcast dollars uh, monochrome, and then start to really think about, hey, digital is a platform that delivers audience, delivers revenue, and delivers engagement for your brand. And that's where we're going as a company to start to address those types of areas. And we're working with, again, some of the people on this platform, and I'm sure some of the people who are attending this, in getting to those spare areas now. And we're trying to go as quickly as we can because the air, the sand shift all the time in this space. So what we want to do is just be out in front of this as much as we can and bring our customers along with us on the ride. So speaking of shifting sands, let's talk about mobile and apps. Where where are we now in terms of what consumers want on apps? Is it still, is it a news and a weather app? Is it a single app approach? Are we niching out? And is that still a trend where apps are spinning up for certain events or, or real niche subjects? Anyone can jump in on this. What's the state of apps right now? I think it's all of the above, Michael. Um, it's really about, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, right? It's about user preference. And, you know, am I going to go to a weather app or am I going to go to my local news app to get weather, right? It's a decision I'm going to make as a user. Publishers have to be in all of those places because that's where the audience is. And think publishers should think of themselves as an audience company and think about, hey, what we want to do is put eyeballs in front of our content. And we want our content to be out there. We want it to be engaged with our content. So it's really all of the above because there's still not a single strategy, I don't think where you can say, hey, we're gonna shut all of this down and we're gonna be all here and everyone's gonna find us here because they're not. Habits are really hard to change. And to get there, you have to start to be everywhere. Does this ring true for the rest of the group? Yeah, mobile apps are still a big part of our strategy at Tegna. Um, and for us, you know, with the huge traffic surge we saw and, and a lot of publishers saw last year with COVID, a big focus was on converting that um, surge of audience into some of our owned products with the app being kind of the most desirable because ultimately it ends up being our most loyal audience. 
um, and we have been able to, to retain them um, to a large degree. So, um, you know, in terms of what they're coming to us for, so, so the way Tegna, our apps are set up, we, we still have individual iOS and Android apps for all of our TV stations. And, you know, news is still the largest driver of traffic to those apps, weather, um, certainly when there's severe weather um, is important as well. But we've also started to add some new, uh, some new features to them to try and differentiate. One of the big areas we've uh, we focused with the mobile apps is around hyper-local. Um, so now everything that we produce uh, in our content management system is geotagged um, and users can see the stories that are closest to them. Uh, and then our users can also share user generated content with us so they can send in photos and videos and news happening in their community. Uh, and that becomes part of the uh, hyper local experience, which we call near me uh, in our apps. So that's one of the areas where uh, we're trying to differentiate with, with through the apps. Okay, so there's still a lot going on uh, widely in mobile then. That's interesting. I want to ask very briefly about digital agencies. Um, are they still a viable business? Is there any profit in digital? Is that, is that a thing that TV stations still want to be in? For those of you who are still in that business, what do you think? And maybe Catherine and Lisa can talk to this. Sure. I, you know, I, I think that I've seen huge success when we have a relationship with a client that gives them a full funnel solution. And that means that we have to offer them TV and our owned and operated digital, as well as third-party platforms. And those solutions on the third-party platforms often are the ones that are going to be able to show them low funnel results, the things that they're really looking for in terms of attribution and results. And so um, I think that that gives us a, you know, a competitive edge when we go out to the market is to say, you have this megaphone of a television station that has the biggest reach of anywhere anything else in the marketplace but then we can also make sure then from a branding standpoint we're reinforcing it on our owned and operated websites and platforms and then if you're trying to reach those people that are in market for your product or service today we can also do that as well and then be able to provide reporting back that shows you how many people we drove to your website how many people filled out a form how many people actually uh, came into your your location you know, all of those things need to be the kind of conversation that our reps need to be having with our clients today in order to serve them so that they can have the results they're looking for. And so for me, it's it's imperative that we're in that business. I see you nodding, Lisa. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, I mean, right now, our third party and digital services make up half of our digital revenue. So really, absolutely imperative. Our, our you know, Oh no, revenue is is very strong. Um, you know, it's not to take away from that, but all of those things that Catherine said. Um, you know, it's the the biggest story is when a client asks our our sales reps, you know, can you do this too? Um, and when we can say yes, we can, we can we can do all of that for you. The last thing that we want is for any of our clients to feel like that they have to go elsewhere and have another relationship in the market where they're spending money. Um, yeah, well, that and, makes we, sense. and that's the risk. I mean, that's the risk for us is that they're going to go find a better partner and see fabulous results and then start taking money off of broadcast television. Right. Just a quick follow up on, on the sellers themselves too. you know, there, there, there's been the sales recalcitrance to digital traditionally with AEs. Um, I, I wonder, has there been an attitude shift among legacy sellers uh, to embrace digital more and maybe has OTT helped move that attitude along a little bit? Yeah, I think I think OTT um, helped bridge the gap a little bit more um, and made some of our AEs a little bit more comfortable in having some of those conversations. I think ultimately um, what moves the needle with an AE who's a little bit reluctant is when their client asks them questions and when the client wants it. Um, that's when I've seen the biggest shift, even from a product perspective, um, you know, because things kind of are hot and then they're not. Um, when when the clients are coming to the AEs and kind of asking questions and wondering about these things that they're hearing, it's it's almost as if we want to make sure that we're educated enough to be able to to speak to those things before a client does. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I've seen the biggest shift. OTT has been a tremendous help <laughs> to 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 um, I think make it a little bit easier for some of those more reluctant ones because it's easier to understand, it's more TV-like? Yeah, it's very much TV-like. Okay, I wanna take some audience questions. We, we have Boku audience questions here and I wanna put these out for anybody to take. Um, 
Here's one, curious about subscriptions versus free OTT apps. Have the broadcasters considered a fee structure for their most popular OTT apps? Have any of you? So at Weather, we have, uh, we, <clears throat> we launched a subscription side to um, weather.com. Um, and the numbers are relatively low. The revenue is actually pretty good though. We have about two and a half percent of our user base uh, paying an annual subscription um, for a, a tiered up weather content. So you can still go to weather, it's still free, get all the information you want. But you know, if you want you know, 24 hour radar, 15 day forecast, stuff like that, it's, it costs a little bit more. And you know, 24.99, it's you know, $2 a month, give or take a little bit. Um, it's not bad. And then you know, it sort of gives you that ability to do some planning. Um, and it sort of gives us that revenue. And it also helps us set up around, you know, as IDFA goes away or has gone away, um, and the programmatic numbers start to fall, we sort of future-proof that a little bit because we have that consistent revenue stream coming in. Um, it's an area that I think more broadcasters will start to get into as some of these changes happen because you're gonna need to offset some of those revenue issues and you're still gonna want that first party data that you're not getting any longer either. Okay, okay. Um, and unless anyone else wants to weigh in on that, another question here. What would you say is the biggest uncertainty regarding content consumption in the streaming age? How long will people want their content to be? Where will they watch it? And what devices they would, would they prefer to watch it on? Who wants to take that? Uncertainties around consumption in the streaming age. I think that we're all learning all of that right now. I mean, that's why those metrics and the data that we're getting is so viable and so important because those are all the questions that we are trying to figure out and learn along the way so that we can be more, a little more proactive and less reactive. Um, so that if there is, if there is uncertainty about people not consuming streaming content, that we can be out ahead of that and provide whatever the next thing is. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty around kind of what the prevailing uh, platform situation is going to be. I mean, so, and whether, you know, apps are still going to be the main part of that ecosystem, or if it's going to move to something that's a little more integrated, right? I mean, you have um, Roku and Fire TV, the two kind of behemoths in the space, space both have kind of their now, their own aggregated content offerings. You have players like, you know, Pluto and others that are kind of recreating the linear channel guide. So I think there is some question as whether, you know, two or three years out from now, if apps is still the prevailing, um, you know, way to reach people on OTT, or if it's more direct partnerships with, uh, with the platforms and TV manufacturers who are also developing their own, uh, their own platforms. I don't know if you're a betting man, sorry, but Adam, if you're a betting man on that, what, what would you predict might be the direction we'd go in there? You know, it, it seems things are moving more towards an integrated model. I mean, I think similar to mobile, if you look back like 15 years when there were, you know, a dozen platforms you had to develop for, and ultimately it ended up really being two. I think you are starting to see the same thing happen with, with, uh, with Fire TV and Roku. And then maybe there's kind of going to be a third in terms of platforms. Um, but I think all of them are trying to create more integrated content experiences. If you look at what Roku is doing with Roku channel, Fire TV has their new, their new news app, which we're, uh, which we're partners in and experimenting with. So, um, so ultimately I think it's going to move more towards a, an integrated structure than an open app ecosystem. And sorry to cut you off there, Catherine. No, I was just going to say, Adam talked about it, it's discoverability and us being, you know, in a place where um, the users can find us and, you know, not in the distribution of our content that it's you know favorable terms too if we have to actually do partnerships with platforms. So those are those are the things that are you know obviously a you know a worry for us. I think today is is that if you want to have that distribution or be a part of um, you know one of these apps that we're actually going to be compensated properly for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, a content question here quickly. All the new content is great. In general, how is it being generated, especially when it's hard to hire lots of new producers, reporters, editors, et cetera, in order to retain margins? How are you driving efficiencies? What needs to be improved on? What tools do you need? For those of you who are ramping up your content, which a lot of you are, how are you paying for it? it it's tricky, right? It, there is no silver bullet answer, right? To 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 the the point of we're not hiring a lot of people. That's that's the reality, right? And so I think there's a few things. I think 
Um, it's, it's absolutely necessary for the people who work for us are multi-skilled, right? So when we think about that, you know, the days when there were three, four person crews going out to shoot one, one and a half minute package, right? We need people who are writers, producers, shooters, editors. I think that's, that's an efficiency that's, that's changed across the industry. Um, I also think, you know, we need to ask ourselves the tough questions. What do we stop doing? What's no longer relevant? What's no longer meaningful? And what's no longer the return on the investment, right? And those are the hard questions to answer and to stop. It's a really, really important one. And then, you know, just continuous modernization mode, right? And whether that's via technology um, or not, you know, we have to continue to look at our operations and modernize. Um, so that we can make the space in the room for, um, for content creation. And, and some of that is rethinking roles that are more traditional. Okay, okay. Now we just have about a minute left. So I wanna take this close on a future, uh, look at the future on a closing note. And I wanna ask each of you really quickly where you see your priorities focusing on these so many fragmented platforms you have to concentrate on. Where are your priorities going to be in the next 12 months? Let's start with Jennifer. Well, I mean, I think, I think streaming, right. You know, we're like, you know, Lisa said, we are, it's, it's a bit of the wild, wild rest west right now. Right. We are all trying to figure this out in real time. And, you know, the, the rate, the rate and acceleration of change, I think is much bigger than with COVID hitting, right. Just consumption behavior, the audience shifting. And so we are laser focused on what the opportunities are in the streaming space and, and navigating that. And to Catherine's point, right, we also have to think about it from the business side, what's best for our businesses and our brands. And so that's a, that's a big focus for us over the next year. Derek? Caught me. I was on mute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the focus for us in the next 12 months at Town News is uh, data. So data is going to be collecting data, protecting data, and activating data. And then on top of that, it's the future of how OTT and CTV are working together. You know, all, th all those things are going to come together. And then how that data plays out across all of our platforms we work with. Lisa? Yeah, I'm OTT streaming is definitely high on the priority list. Um, determining what our content strategy is going to be and how to create that and develop that. Um, we've also, by way of our, our new owners at Allen Media, um, you know, they have the Local Now app. And I think that that's something that is still very, very new for us on the broadcast side and something that we want to be able to leverage and take advantage of. I think that there's an opportunity there for, 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 for broadcast and for our content. So that's definitely something high on the list that we're going to be exploring. Adam? Yeah, streaming as well, both in terms of ramping up and, and integrating the investments we've made in Verify and Locked On, but then also, you know, strategically what we do at the station level uh, to really um, reinvent our content for uh, for the streaming world. Um, that's our, our biggest focus. Ethan? I think it's really around monetization and helping our current customers and our future customers um, be able to monetize. Um, and if you kind of look at a, at a television newsroom, the weather center is kind of a cost center right now. If we can make that a profit center and really create revenue coming out of the weather center, take those lessons and expand our footprint, that's I think where we want to get to. And last word, Catherine. So data obviously is a big part of what we're focused on. I didn't mention the fact that we are launching a data management platform for all of this data that we're actually pulling in right now so that we can actually make it actionable. So um, that is a big focus, streaming, um, live streaming. I think that local um, has huge value when it comes to live and being able to distribute that across our platforms. And then of course, next-gen television and being able to figure out how we can actually get into that space and look at um, offering addressability. And so that is, that is another area of focus for us in all of our markets. Okay, so you heard it there, streaming, content, monetization, data, Lots for all of you to be focusing on in the next 12 months. Thank you all for being here. Lisa Bishop, Catherine Bedellamente, Jennifer Mitchell, Adam Ostro, Ethan Drellinger, and Derek Gabler. Thanks to all of you for being here today for your great insights. Thanks to all of you for watching and so long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Always good to see you. Great job. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, Michael. All right.